Okay, so uh, Dr. David Boyd is on faculty at BJU in Greenville, South Carolina. He graduated from BJU, Bachelor of Science in Biology, then went to Clemson, which is it's in the same uh, area, an hour away or so. Uh, got a Master's of Science in Entomology, so the study of insects, and a PhD in Entomology. This is not etymology, this is entomology, quite, quite different. Um, study of insects, and then also an MA in Physical Studies from BJU. So really a kind of a, a unique mix here, able to bring the scientific side, obviously, um, but also the theological background. And uh, Dr. Boyd teaches now at BJU introductory biology, animal biology. His dissertation or his graduate work focused on the biological control of insects and function of digestive enzymes and mouth part morphology in predaceous, predatory, and herbivorous insects. And then he worked as a research entomologist five and a half years at the USDA uh, Agricultural Research Service. Um, so that's the, the background on scientific side, academic side. I know Dr. Boyd, I've known uh, Dr. Boyd for 20 years or something. Um, and now he is a, in the leadership, very active at my local church in Greenville, South Carolina. And so that, all, everything I gave was the academic side, but in the, uh, the ministry side and the heart side, he has a very clear heart for serving the Lord and using his skills and his research abilities and his experience to serve the church, to serve God's people, and tonight to serve us. Um, so I was delighted. I mean, he's very busy, he took a, took, took dedication of his time to prepare and then to be with us here tonight. I was delighted that he's willing to give us the time and that we're able to benefit from his uh, his expertise tonight. The great thing is any questions about anything you've ever wondered in all of science and young earth creationism and um, even, you know, the, the cultural, theological, philosophical, and historical manifestations thereof, Dr. Boyd can answer all of your questions tonight in the next two hours. Okay, obviously not, but we're going to do the best we can to, uh, to hear, to learn, and we will definitely benefit from what we have. So recognizing covering a massive question in a short time, uh, we'll use the time the best way that we can. Okay, Brother John Glass, if you can open us in prayer. After that, Dr. Boyd, the time is yours. Um, so let's open in prayer, and then we'll continue from there. Okay, let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this opportunity we have to listen to Dr. Boyd and share what you laid on his heart. We pray, Lord, that you give us hearts that are willing to listen and to hear. We ask that your Holy Spirit work through us and through this time. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Joel. Thank you for praying, John. Um, this is a pretty big topic that we're asked to do. Um, I had set up some slides here to kind of introduce myself, but Joel did such a good job that I don't feel like I need to do that. So that is good. He did leave out <clears throat> one important thing, and that's who my family is. And so I think you can see a picture of my family up there. Um, is that right? Okay, uh, very good. <clears throat> so I, um, I married my wife, Jennifer, back in 1998, so just over 20 years, and the Lord's given us uh, these five wonderful children. My oldest there on the right, Jesse, <clears throat> he um, is a freshman in college. And then uh, we go all the way down to my 10 year old, um, which just for some you know family connections, Joel's brother Daniel has a daughter that's her age and they're pretty good friends. They keep up, he, she's in uh, Germany, but they keep up my uh, letters and whenever um, uh, Joel's mom goes to visit, she usually brings something back or, or takes uh, take something over there from, from Michaela. So anyway, the Lord's given me a wonderful family, very thankful uh, for them. Um, <clears throat> I wanted to introduce to you some of the classes that I teach here at Bob Jones to kind of give you a better perspective of maybe where I'm coming from, because um, I am an entomologist, um, but I teach, I'm the, I'm the department head here at Bob Jones, and so I teach the uh, general biology class, the freshman level, um, and I, I really do enjoy that. The Lord sends us literally hundreds of students every year uh, in the sciences or the health sciences to be able to, to teach and, and grow for the Lord. And then they're going out and serving in a science field or medical field. 
um, specifically because I'm an entomologist. I teach things related to animals without a backbone. So that's why you see those classes, entomology and parasitology and invertebrate zoology. <clears throat> and I really, uh, really enjoy those things. I have my doctorate in entomology, but if I could do it again, I would go get a doctorate in parasitology. Um, I would also get a doctorate in ornithology, which is birds, if I could do that. And uh, maybe the Lord will give me that one day, but I have other things to do right now. <clears throat> and then I also teach our sophomore level class on um, introduction to animal diversity, which I really enjoy. And then um, the class that's probably more important for here is I teach a class on evolution and origins. It's a class that all of our science majors um, have to take, and they usually take that their junior or senior year. And I like to say that I teach evolution from a biblical perspective. And that kind of catches some people off guard because um, you say, how can you do that? Well, if you think of it this way, I want my students to know more about evolution than the evolutionists do so that when they go into uh, their fields, they go into the secular science world or into the medical field, they, um, they know what's coming and um, they know how to, to have good conversations. Uh, my end goal is that through that class, they'll be able to have redemptive conversations with people who would really not darken the door of any church or really not give you or me or anybody else with a, uh, you know, associated with anything Christian, wouldn't give them the time of day. But here their colleagues will be and will be able to, to have those conversations and uh, be able to lead them to Christ. So that's my goal. <clears throat> so now that it's 8-12, when I put this slide up, I, my first thought about teaching this class was, what? How can we do this in only two hours? So um, I've interacted with Joel a little bit about uh, what to discuss with you guys today. And um, I think I've narrowed it down to some some topics that might be helpful to you. And I, I really have no clue how we're going to get through all two hours. Um, I have two things against me. One is that um, I've never done this before. Most of my teaching is uh, where I can actually see and get feedback from people on an instant basis. That's what I'm comfortable doing. Um, and the other thing is that um, I'm teaching to people whose um, um, English is not your first language. And so I'm, my goal is to speak slowly and clearly. And if uh, um, well, let's see, there's a third thing against me, and that's that I'm from South Georgia, and that's the state of Georgia, not the country. And down there, we, we, teach, we do speak slowly, but we speak in a dialect that most foreigners don't understand. It's called Southern. So if, <laughs> if uh, you know what I'm talking about, you know that that's against me as well. But how am I doing? Can you guys talk to me at all or, or anything like that? Sure. Awesome. I just see him looking through uh, chat response. So again, no monosyllabic words. Text is easier, I think, from uh, the perspective of most of the men writing in. Um, okay. So hopefully that's the way we end up interacting. So. Okay. And unfortunately, they're they're used to me, which is I, talking too fast is one of my grand struggles. So that's the good news. Okay. Somebody who talks too fast. Okay. Well, I'm I'm purposely not looking at the chat box. So um, if something does come up, please interrupt me at any time because I would more, I would much rather um, answer questions that come to people's minds than necessarily cover a certain amount of information. Okay. Well, this is, um, this is my basic outline and I think it might be helpful to you. I, I wanna give you an introduction to what I call recent creation. And I'm gonna talk to you a little about, about why I choose uh, that term instead of young earth creation, even though they really are synonymous. Um, I want to talk to you a little bit about fossils as opposed to um, things like the, the speed of light. These are two uh, critical areas about the age of the earth or the age of the universe. And I don't feel very comfortable talking about um, things related to physics, which, so we'll, we'll deal with things uh, dealing with fossils, which is more geology based, which I'm still uncomfortable with, but um, have a little bit more uh, knowledge about. And then I want to talk to you about um, evolution versus adaptation. And I'll um, deal more about that when we get, get there. Some people like to use the terms uh, microevolution and macroevolution. 
And I want to spend a little time with you talking about uh, why I don't use those terms and why I use the terms evolution and adaptation and how that becomes more um, helpful to us in our discussions. And then I do have a, um, some resources that I want to share with you. And um, if we're running out of time, um, probably the last 10 minutes or so, I'll probably jump to that so that we, um, we can get to, to some more helpful information. I did um, send Joel some, uh, some readings uh, for you guys, and they're more of a, a defense of young earth creation. And I think they'll be helpful to you, especially after the things that we discuss here today. And then I also sent a link uh, to one of the papers that I wrote that's um, published on the Answers in Genesis website. And it gives you a better idea about how somebody like me um, interacts with um, the diversity of life we have today, because there are many, many more animals on the earth, um, species-wise, than could ever fit on the ark. So how do, we, um, how do we respond to something like that? How do we get the number of species today from only a few thousand years ago? And I think that will be a help to you. Okay. So let's get started here with this idea, an introduction to a uh, recent creation, and then um, I'm going to also discuss the competing theories, and these are the primary competing, competing theories that I'm going to talk to you about. Um, old Earth creation, and I'm going to focus in on progressive creation, um, and then theistic evolution, which now comes in um, some different flavors or uh, different names. Uh, the big one now is BioLogos, and they prefer the name creationary evolution, and I'll talk to you about why that is. And then we'll just briefly touch on the idea of naturalistic evolution or materialistic evolution. Okay, so far? All right. So recent creation. <clears throat> what is recent creation? That um, really it boils down to this idea that um, what the Bible says is true. If we take uh, the genealogies, especially there in Genesis 5 and 11, and other genealogies too, and um, in the Chronicles, and, and even the New Testament genealogies, compile all those together. And um, it's really difficult to get anything more than about 6,000 years. Um, the way we get between six and 10, or some people might say between six and 12,000 years would be because of some apparent gaps um, in those genealogies. Um, but in the um, really in the short of it, people that hold to recent creation are ones who um, believe that what the Bible says is true. We can take it um, at its at face value. Um, we don't have to take anything that science tells us to try to reinterpret what it says. Just take it for what it says. And if that's the, and if the Bible is true because God is true, then this is what you're really what you're left with is that God created the world and everything in it less than 10,000 years ago. Well, this really has the name of young earth creation. And I think anywhere you go, you'll hear people talk about that. Um, and so let me just tell you a little bit about why I like the term recent creation over young earth creation. And um, you can do with this whatever you would like. Um, but with many terms that have been around for a long time, um, they often carry unintended baggage with them. So if you're talking to somebody <clears throat> um, uh, about uh, the age of the earth or um, evolution versus creation, and you mention that you're a young earth creationist, many people have interacted with other people who say they're young earth creationist, and they automatically uh, put you in that same category with some of those. Um, so within that camp of young earth creation, there are uh, quite a few people who really um, hold to some really, uh, what I'm going to call strange ideas. Um, and so I, I don't want to necessarily be lumped with those. One, one example of a strange idea is that um, at creation, God created all the species and they haven't changed. So all the species that we have today are the same species that um, God created back on uh, days four, or days five and six of creation. Um, that doesn't take into account the idea that 
the vast majority of those were killed on the flood and that um, all the species that we have today could, could not fit on the ark unless the ark was about the size of America, the United States, then maybe we could have fit them on there. Um, so there has to be something else besides that. So um, I'm not opposed to the idea of using that, that and um, you'll see some of my own publications where I use that phrase based on the, uh, who, the, who the intended readers are. Um, but in general, I use the term recent creation because most people aren't familiar with that and they'll ask me what I mean by that. And that's really where I think we all want to be. We want to, we want to be able to explain ourselves or to actually enter into a discussion and not just be labeled something that we don't want to be labeled. So that's why I use the term recent creation, but it is synonymous with young earth creation and the same idea there. And you can use it if you want to. Um, one of the papers that I, I sent uh, through Joel to you, I just did it this morning, so I'm not sure that you would have gotten that yet. But one of the authors is a guy named Mortensen, and um, he has several points. This point that I give you here um, is point number 10, and he explains that um, much, much better than I did on the, where we get the uh, age of the earth. And he goes from six to 12,000 in that article. So not only do we believe that God created the world and everything in it six to 10,000 years ago, we also believe that God created the universe in six literal days. Those would be um, what we would call solar days or 24 hour days. Um, there's a lot of debate on whether those days in creation are literal 24 hours a day. And one of my colleagues, uh, his name is George Matsko, he would always use the term solar days. And I asked him why. And he said, because um, solar days aren't 24 hours, they're 23 hours and I don't know how many minutes. <laughs> um, but um, I guess the, uh, the, the length of a day changes over time. And so to be able to say solar days is a little bit better. And then we also believe in a literal worldwide flood um, that destroyed all air breathing life. Now that's an important idea because we don't believe it destroyed all the, uh, all the fish or other organisms. And, and maybe I shouldn't say all air breathing life if we were to include things like whales that are air breathing. But <clears throat> um, the general idea is that uh, land animals uh, were destroyed except those that were rescued on the ark. Now those three key ideas, the age of the earth, the six literal days, and the idea of a literal flood are what distinguishes young earth creation or recent creation from all the rest. So if you hold to a, a progressive creation or an old earth creation, um, these are, are, are not what they believe. And then um, theistic evolution or evolutionary creation, um, this is definitely not what they believe. And then of course, a materialistic evolutionist, I wouldn't even know what you're talking about um, in that case. And so those are the distinctives. And again, what, why? Why do we believe this? And this is because this is what the Bible says when you take it at face value. Um, and I believe that God intended to, for us to take it from what it says. Other would argue about that. And when we get to some of those, um, Maybe I'll discuss that at that time. Let's uh, move to this idea, old earth creation. Um, this is a, I think within old earth creation, there's probably more, um, uh, more variations of this than any of the others. Um, if you read any um, modern or recent evangelical um, they have some form of old earth creation in their understanding. <clears throat> they do believe that the universe and everything in it was created by God, but that science clearly indicates that the universe is billions of years old. The earth itself is millions of years old, and there's no reason to doubt that. Um, they base that on you know, the starlight issue, how, how fast light moves and how far the, the stars are, which, you know, based on that information is billions of years. And then uh, radiometric dating, which indicates that some of the rocks 
uh, here on Earth are uh, millions of years old. And so that's why they're basing that on. So then what do you do with those scriptures that seem to indicate otherwise? It's the idea that um, God was just communicating with people of the day, and they only understood that what, what he told them. And his, in, his intent was not to tell us exactly when or how long ago. And that's um, how they come to that point. Okay. Um, I mentioned earlier that this is pervasive within evangelicalism. Um, um, when I took systematic theology, this was quite a few years ago, I, I did my best to find a systematic theology that really took its stand with a recent creation. And um, all the ones that we would consider to be good, whether it be um, Grudem, here now I'm going to lose my, my thought here. Do I have Grudem here? Nope. Hang on. Yes, that's the one that I know. Erickson, Grudem and Erickson, uh, which are two of the top ones. They're going to hold to some form of old earth creation. And then um, I looked at one last night, one that my pastor, um, Pastor Minnick recently mentioned, a guy named Culver. Um, and I've been trying to work my way through that just for my own personal good. And when I read through his section on creation, I'm not quite sure where he lands on this. He's, he's a pretty good, um, pretty good writer, and he's, his emphasis is on what we can learn from, um, from these um, passages on our, for, for our own good. And he tries to steer away from the age of the earth and things like that. Um, but I have um, <clears throat> with me another good book, The New Dictionary of Biblical Theology, and if you read the area here, it's again going to hold to some type of old earth creation. Um, and, you know, if you, I, I think uh, uh, Raymond is another systematic theology, and, and he may come the closest to something along the lines of uh, what I believe the Bible teaches. But even then, there's some, some um, discussion about that. So, Joel, do you know of any systematic theology that holds to a recent creation? Um, McCune, <laughs> so that's the, the McCune, writer yeah. up in Detroit, he would. Okay, yeah, and that came out, what, two or three years ago? Yeah, right, volume by volume, last maybe five to three years ago. So, yeah. Okay, yeah, I haven't seen that one. I heard about that one. I'm glad that you mentioned that one, because I, I think that he does hold to a recent creation, and I was I was glad to hear about that one. But again, if um, you come to Bob Jones Seminary, the, the one, the systematic theology textbooks that we would use, all hold to some form of old earth creation. And that really should give us pause to, to question, are, is what we're believing right? I mean, can so many of these people actually be wrong? And that, the answer is, well, I, well, often I've wondered, people ask, well, when we get to heaven, will God make all things clear to us? And I think over time, maybe he will, but I don't think that this type of question will be on, the, on, the, on our thoughts or our minds. Uh, what's going to be on our thoughts and our minds is just our Savior and being able to be in His presence and really glory in that. So I don't know if uh, the Lord will make all these things clear or not, but this is what I know. When I when I get to heaven, I, I want to, in good conscience, be able to tell the Lord that I took Him at His word. And, and that really just gets us to recent creation. Um, and I'll talk about that in just a little bit, too, about our hermeneutics. Okay. So where do they, how do they then take Genesis 1 through 11, the old earth creation? And it's, it tends to be more figurative. Um, so what about things like a literal atom? That, that gets to be um, a little dicey because um, if you're an evangelical, you have to believe that there was a literal atom. Well, when was he created? Did he, was it a, a creation that happened later? Or was it really... I don't know. They, you really have to come up with some, some creative ways of figuring that out. So let me introduce you to one, and um, I'm introducing you to this one probably because you've heard of them, and this is the idea of progressive creation. It's a form of old earth creation, but maybe you've heard of Hugh Ross. He's a, a physicist, and then Fazala Rana, who is a um, microbiologist, and they've produced some really good and helpful books, but they hold to this old earth creation in a form um, that's called progressive creation. So when you think of the idea of progressive, it just means that God created in an instant of time, 
many times, literally over billions of years. So 13.4 billion years ago, God created the universe. And then uh, you know, four, four billion years ago, God created the earth. And then, you know, um, the God started creating the animals and uh, throughout time. So they were instant creations. And so he gets around the problem of the literal Adam because um, throughout time, God created Adam and Eve, um, just like he said he did. Um, but it was uh, literally billions of years after he created most other things. Okay, so when you, if you're ever to go, I have um, this Reasons to Believe uh, website to click on here, but I'm not going to do that right now because of uh, where we are in our time. But you can go to that website and, and start looking through there, and you really can find some helpful information, especially when it comes to um, things dealing with um, evolution, um, the evolution of life from non-life, which they um, are, are against. And so you can find some, some helpful information there. But again, they're taking um, those first parts of, of the Bible, first 11 chapters, and then those other um, parts of the scripture that indicate a recent creation and are trying to interpret them um, with a, a hermeneutic that, doesn't, that they wouldn't apply to almost anywhere else in the scripture. Um, the one that I wanted to spend the most time on this morning is theistic evolution because it's making a big impact today within evangelicalism. And uh, the one group that I'm going to tell you about um, is evangelical about their theistic evolution. They're wanting to uh, get this spread into every evangelical institution on the planet Earth. So whether you're in uh, Vietnam or Singapore, or California, or South America, they, they have money and they have people and they're doing their best to get this um, spread throughout the world. And um, it's a little bit of a scary thing to me um, because of um, they really, this is not the gospel. This is another gospel that they're preaching, but it sounds like um, what, if you're not uh, discerning, it sounds like they're um, speaking in love and um, that folks like me are the enemy. So I want you to be careful about these guys. They've actually come up with a different term. Uh, the group that I'm talking about is BioLogos, and we're going to go to their website in just a second. Um, they prefer the term evolutionary creation. And the reason they want to do that is because theistic evolution puts the noun on evolution, and they say that they're creationists. Well, then how did God create the world? And they say through the evolutionary processes that materialistic evolution has taught us. So they believe um, everything that evolution does, they just believe that God had some part in that. Okay, so it's just the idea that, that God created the universe and everything in it by the process of materialistic evolution. Now I'm going to click on this link, and uh, Joel, I'm looking at you to let me know if it comes up or not, okay? <laughs> um, I may have to learn how to to share another page or something. Did anything change on that? Uh, no, I don't see oh. it. All right, here we go. I got this. That should show the website, right? I see it now. That's it. Okay. That's good. Very Thank good. You. Now I got to find out how I can see it. <laughs> okay. This is all right. Very good. All right. Get rid of that. They're going to try to get you to contribute every every time, um, but they have a very uh, fancy website here, and um, one of the things that they have are something like this: the BioLogos Basics. And um, I'm going to drill down on this, <clears throat> and then Joel, there's a two-minute video that I'm hoping to show. So just give me the thumbs up or the thumbs down if this is if this is going on. Actually. Okay. It's coming up. I'm sorry. Um, I was looking at the wrong screen. If you, what's the title of the video? I think I can pull it up on my end. Well, it's just right. It's embedded right in the uh, website. So is it not sharing my screen right now? It's not. I'm sorry. Um, oh, no, I, this work. I can look on my end. I see a couple of different things. I can just click through and then put it up. Is it on the front page or where would we find it? No, hang on one second, because maybe I can, um, let me go back. I, I put you in a different spot. 
But you know what? This technology is working great, by the way. I'm really liking it. And if we don't, um, if we're if we're not able to see it, that, that's okay. Okay. Even if you're able to describe uh, it. Oh, here we go. Maybe. I think what I did is I I just shared the desktop instead of the actual program. So I think this should probably give it to us. Is it up there now? I don't see it still. Okay. Well, let's see. Well, it's okay. We don't have to see. We don't have to see it. And it may be actually better for our time uh, to not see that. So let's just not not watch that. Sound like a good plan? But if um, I would encourage you guys to go to um, to BioLogos. Well, okay. Is it there now? Because there's some. Or maybe you're sharing that now. I stole it from you, and I'm just putting up the the website on here. So. Oh, okay. All right. Very good. Thank you for stealing in the in the biblical sense of the word. I mean, the Christian sense of the word. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Very good. Well, this is. Um, let me just talk to you about it instead of um, uh, showing you the video. Um, and and I'm seeing some of you on here. Have, and you can shake your head yes or no. Have Have you ever heard of BioLogos before? No. I'm hearing, I'm seeing most people shake their head no. Okay, well, I'm glad that I'm bringing that up. I'm, I'm only seeing four people at a time. So um, I think um, I think that's okay. But it, I really do wanna caution you that they're gonna, um, they're spreading throughout the world. And their idea is that um, they wanna have a dialogue between you and, uh, and science. But what they mean by dialogue is not a discussion. It really is more the idea that they want to push their ideas on everybody and demonstrate that they're they're really the the true source, and not not you, not somebody like me. I'm going to try to get us back to um, to my PowerPoint. Did, uh, did are you still? Um, all I see now is you, Joel. Oh, here we go. Maybe I can share it now. Okay. Um, all right. Here we go. I'm going to go back to this. Oh, you know what? I didn't hit the share button. That was it. I kept clicking thinking that I was sharing, but you got to click and then click share, but it's okay. I think we, I think we're doing the right thing because it's already, wow. Okay. Time is flying. All right. <clears throat> Here's an important idea about BioLogos is that they believe that Adam is not a, was not a true person, but that um, the Adam in scripture is, um, is represented by about 10,000 people um, that evolved from some chimp-like ancestor. So they, they really do believe uh, what evolution tells us about um, the evolution of humans. That, um, and then when you try to get them a win, uh, get them to answer the question, when did um, God's image be put into man? Um, you can get some pretty um, interesting ideas. But the idea that, um, that they basically come down to the idea that whenever humans knew that they were sinning against God is when they had the image of God. And to me, that seems a little um, circular there. Um, because when God created man, he didn't create humans to um, be in a sinful relationship with him. He um, created humans to have a relationship with him that is pure. And it was only after sin came that that relationship was broken. And so then when you start asking them about when did sin come, that then gets to be another interesting discussion. And then ultimately, what do you think the important idea here is? No. Oh. And it really comes to the question of the second Adam. Who is the second Adam? And does it really matter if there was a true first Adam for the second Adam's uh, work on the cross to be effective? And um, they have to come up with some very interesting ideas to work around that. But they do, and they have some really smart people helping them. But this is really the um, I, what I think one of the most difficult things about them, not difficult, the things that we need to be aware that we, we know, that they really believe that science should help us interpret the scripture. What we try to do is we try to use the scripture to help us interpret science. Um, and so they're putting a really 
a, a heavy burden on science as the ultimate truth. And I'm not sure why that is, but it really, I think if we were to try to get it down to a, um, a biblical perspective, this is well, one of the works of the flesh where we have um, a desire to please men more than we have the desire to please God. Or maybe I should say it this way, that um, we're wanting the approval of man more so than the approval of God. Um, but to hear them talk, and if you were to go onto that BioLogos website and to look at some of the videos that they have there, not only are they very well done, but they appear to be very compassionate and loving and kind. And they are the ones that, um, that you need to listen to. But again, I want to caution you that they are presenting to you another gospel, not a true gospel, not the one um, clearly indicated in the scriptures. Okay. And I'm going to, uh, I want to really emphasize this with you that BioLogos is on a mission. Um, uh, for uh, maybe some of you know this name, but they're heavily funded by the Templeton Foundation. And the uh, people who have the money in the Templeton Foundation are no friends of evangelicalism. They don't believe in the literal resurrection of Christ and um, things like that. So just be cautious with um, biologos and uh, theistic evolution. Well, what about me? I teach at a, a recent creation university, and we have students that come in who already hold to some form of theistic evolution or to biologos and specifically. Um, and they're rare, but they do, um, they do come in, and whenever one of these students wants to dialogue, um, the discussion really is more on uh, why they're right and we're wrong. And it really never gets to be a good discussion of any kind. Um, I've been to some of the, I've been to one conference that was sponsored by BioLogos. One of my colleagues and I went there um, because we wanted to, um, to hear them, hear from their own mouths uh, what they had to speak. And we we actually got to sit at the um, at dinner or lunch with some of the main speakers and um, interact with them at some time and uh, really found um, that, that what I'm saying to you is true, that they really um, don't want to have a discussion. They really want to convince us that um, recent creation or even these other forms of old earth creation that hold to a literal atom can't be valid because of, of science. And in that uh, one of the things that I took away from that meeting, there was a question that was asked to one of the speakers about um, his, his thinking um, about Adam and whether or not he was literal and uh, the implications of that. And the question was, well, then do we, do we have to then uh, change our thinking about things like justification? And the answer was no surprise to me. And he says, yes. And, and that I, I, I'm actually even shocked that I'm still, I mean, I was not surprised, but I'm shocked that somebody would say that, that if we, um, if we change our views on Genesis 1 through 11, then really the entirety of scripture is, is up for a, a different interpretation. And um, these folks are doing their best to uh, provide something that is consistent within their worldview. And for them to be able to do that, they do have to change uh, basic soteriology uh, to not mean what the scripture really says. And so that's why I caution you that this is um, another gospel. It's not the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, but they're pervasive, and uh, they are coming your way. So be on the alert. Now, real quickly, um, let's just hit naturalistic evolution. There's really not... Uh, much more than I need to say, but this is basic uh, materialism, that there is no God, and um, they hold the uh, Big Bang cosmology. And, uh, um, but that's a competing theory to recent creation, and this would uh, be what uh, here in the United States uh, people are taught in our, our public education system and um, our universities, and it is the ruling, um, the reigning uh, theory uh, within biology, as well as um, uh, the other sciences. And I'll talk more about that later. 
So here's a good question for us. Why then for, for someone like me, why recent creation over other things like old earth or especially over um, biologos or theistic evolution? And this is what it boils down for, for me, is it really is the only theory there that takes God's word for what it says. And I've emphasized that to you a couple times already this morning, or I guess for you this evening. Is that what it is, Joel, this evening for you? Right. Okay. Right, yeah. um, and here's the other thing to think about. It has the fewest hermeneutical problems. In other words, if we uh, take God's word for what it says and just take it straight forward with a, a literal and a historical approach, um, we don't have to come up with ways to make it say what it doesn't say. And so when you read people like Grudem or Erickson or some of these other systematic theologies that when they use that um, a, a good hermeneutic for most of the scriptures, they're not trying to uh, make the scripture say what it doesn't say. But when they start talking about creation, um, you find them spending lots and lots of pages trying to explain why it doesn't mean what it says. And I think any time that you run into that, that should cause you to pause and ask why. Why, why do we have to do that? Why do we have to, to change what the Bible says? And, and it really has to do with science. Um, so think with me, science really is uh, one of those things in today's society, at least here in the United States, um, where a lot of emphasis is put on truth. Uh, the idea that what science gives us is truth. But as a scientist, um, that, that's the work that I do um, on a daily basis. It's, it really is always changing. The theories change. Now, as new information comes in, we have to change our models. And, and um, so what folks like BioLogos are doing is saying we need to change our interpretation of scripture based on what science is telling us. And that is uh, like walking on jello because science is like jello. It changes all the time. Um, so um, as believers, I believe, I believe that we need to interpret science based on uh, the unchanging word of God. And I think that really is going to give us a, a much more stable foundation. And then as uh, science changes, we're not surprised because what God says is clearly true. <coughs> Well, that's my, um, my first set on uh, the, the basic ideas uh, within Christendom, anyway, within the broader evangelical world, the theories of creation and why I believe in recent creation. So are there any uh, questions that have come up, Joel, that I need to address at this time? I think we're, uh, we're good on that for now. I, this, is, this, is, this is excellent. We did a, a discussion of the history of apologetics and just trace how at each phase apologists have tended to adjust theology to fit the prevailing uh -huh. ideas of the day. So Neoplatonism, Aristotelianism, as this, the wind changes, then a whole period for several hundred years will change. We're just seeing this, right? I mean, this is, yep. this is yep. what it is. It's the same effect. So great content. Thank you. Okay, very good. Well, let's move on to fossils. Where this is a big, a big change, guys. <laughs> but I'm going to try to go through this uh, rather quickly so that we have um, the, the majority of our next hour um, dealing with adaptation and evolution because I think that'll probably be the most helpful to you. So actually, um, the picture that's on the screen of that fossil insect is the picture that I took, and so I was pretty, um, pretty excited that I could. Um, I could share one of my pictures with somebody anyway that cares. <laughs> um, I, I found that. I, um, I mentioned to you that within Young Earth Creation, there's some, um, some strange ideas. Well, I, I um, got involved with a, a lady who was interested in insect fossils, and she wanted to write a book um, <clears throat> using um, insect fossils as a way to indicate that the Earth is young. And so I tried to help her for a little bit, but um, and so this is one of the fossils she sent me and I was able to take a picture of. And, um, but um, there were some other really strange things going on. So I haven't heard from her in several years and, and, I'm, and I'm okay with that. <laughs> so, but I, I'm glad that I can share this picture with you. So let me just 
um, tell you real quickly that the purpose for this particular segment is to deal with uh, the age of the earth because science tells us that the age of the earth um, is um, billions of years old, 3.5 or 3.6. We're not sure it changes periodically. <coughs> um, and that the geological record is a record of time um, for millions, millions of those years. And what I'm gonna try to help us with is that the geological record is, um, can be more really better interpreted as um, indication of a worldwide flood as um, given to us in Genesis. So let's find out what the geological time scale is, <coughs> excuse me, and then how, how we can get there. So this little wheel that I have up here, it's hard to read and I'm sorry about that, but all this is telling us is this um, time frame here of uh, 4.5, a billion years ago, that's what the GA is, billions of years ago. It's this chronology, this clock <clears throat> that runs from uh, 12 a.m. to noon. And um, all the time frame here <clears throat> is based on uh, geological strata. And so these time frames like the Archaean, and then you get up here to like the Paleozoic and the Mesozoic, all of those are based on um, the, the different layers. So let me give you this, and again, the only reason I'm showing you this picture is because so, you can see that it looks like a clock. And so we're talking about something that's chronological. And so if we can take this backwards, we can actually get to the beginning of the founding or the creation of the earth. And based on these methods, it's like four point something billion years ago. Well, <clears throat> so let's talk then about geological time scale. This is a, a graphic, um, a, just a cartoon picture that shows that if we can, excuse me, cut through the earth um, at different layers, th there really are different layers. And you can see that there's some bedrock down at the bottom where there are no fossils at all. Um, and then as we go up through time, some of these layers, not all of them, some of these layers have fossils and um, we can then base this idea that the oldest, the ones on the bottom are the oldest layers. <clears throat> and and that, that makes sense. And I like to use the illustration of what I do every Saturday morning. I make pancakes for my family. And for those of you who aren't familiar with pancakes, you <clears throat> put some batter on a griddle and you end up with a nice circle of um, some real tasty, um, tasty food there. It's basically a, a sweet bread. And then as they come off the griddle, you put them on a plate and then they stack up. Well, the pancakes on the bottom were the ones that I made first. So that might be when I made them at 7.30 in the morning. But as I go through time, you know, at 7.45, 15 minutes later, the ones that just came off the griddle are on the top. So the oldest ones are on the bottom, the most recent ones are on the top. And of course, which ones do we all want to eat? We want to eat the ones that are on the top. They're the freshest. That's right. But that's the same basic idea here. <clears throat> well, what, were that, what, what, were, what would happen if I was walking to the uh, table and I um, tripped and fell and my pancakes hit the floor? And then I went and I picked them all up and stacked them back uh, up again. Would we know which one was came off the griddle first just by the stacking? Uh, no. <clears throat> We'd probably be able to tell by which one was the coldest and which was the warmest. But that's uh, beside the point. And, and what we find in the geological records is that sometimes things get turned upside down and it can cause some trouble. <clears throat> and uh, better yet, we have things that are uh, what we're gonna call sedimentary layers. And that would be in my illustration of <clears throat> taking that uh, you know, pancake and putting it in a blender and then trying to put it back down. And uh, that's what we find, that's actually where we find all our fossils. And if you blend up a pancake, <clears throat> you really have no idea when it was made. So keep that in mind. In our sedimentary rocks, where our fossils are, we really don't know how old they are. Okay. <clears throat> so with that idea in mind, to, to understand the geological time scale, we have to know something about rocks. Okay. <clears throat> um, there's three types of rocks. I have a picture that's going to help us with this. Um, igneous, sedimentary, 
and metamorphic. So igneous rocks are those that are formed like after a lava flow. So we have a volcano and lava is formed and it comes out and as it cools, <clears throat> um, there are things that happen chemically within that rock that we can go back and, and date it. And we say we actually know how old that is. Sedimentary rock is like what you find on the, on the beach. So you have sand, which is made up of rocks that have been uh, destroyed by the waves, or a lot of times it also include things like shells from, from mussels or, <clears throat> or other animals. And it's been uh, deposited um, somewhere and then under pressure and heat has formed into something that's rock-like. And then there's metamorphic rock, which um, th there's something that has happened that has actually changed that rock. And it's actually changed uh, our ability to be able to date that rock. <clears throat> Again, we're trying to figure out how old things are. And the geological time scale is one way to do that. So how do we date the rocks? The only rocks that we can actually date are igneous rocks. Okay, so here's what we call the rock cycle. Here's that the igneous rock. Do you, do you actually see my cursor moving at all? We do. Oh, awesome. Okay, so I'm, I'm pointing to the igneous rock, and this is rock that's formed um, by lava or, or other means like that. So it's, um, <clears throat> after it's cooled, um, the particular uh, chemicals or the, the, um, those things that can change over time, um, they're, they're now fixed in this igneous rock. Um, some of these, um, some of this rock can actually be eroded, broken up by wind, water, or whatever, and it breaks it up into sand. That can then be spread over a certain area and then form into sedimentary rocks. Both the igneous rocks and the sedimentary rocks can change with heat and pressure and form a different type of rock. So with those ideas and rocks, that gets us to which of those rocks can we actually put a date to. And the only one is igneous rock. Sedimentary rock is just a mixture of a whole bunch of different rocks that have different ages. And metamorphic rock doesn't tell us how old the original rock was, it just can tell us how long ago that rock has, uh, has changed. But even then, it's not, not too good. All right, so are we at our good five minute spot now, Brother Joel? Great, absolutely, sounds good. Um, this, is, this is delightful, really enjoying this. Yes, so let's do that, let's take a five minute break. I've got two minutes until the hour. Let's just come back at three minutes after the hour and we'll pick up there. Okay. Okay, thank you. For that break, <clears throat> because I needed that probably more than you all did. So we're talking about rocks. Are, are there been any uh, questions that came up? I didn't, I was gonna look for those. We are still all set. Yep, we can, we can just- Okay. <clears throat> um, so we're talking about, um, but the age of the earth based on the geological rocks. And now we need to talk about something called absolute ages and relative ages. So I think we can all um, agree what a, a rel an absolute age, um, <clears throat> an absolute age is like, like my age. I'm, I'm 45 and I know that because of um, my birth certificate and my parents tell me when I was born. Okay, uh, my relative age kind of goes to the idea um, when I went to a restaurant just a few days ago, I was talking to the lady and I told her that I had five children. And so she gave me the, uh, the senior discount. And she said, if somebody has five children, you must be 65 by now. <laughs> I still don't know. Um, why that is, but she was basing that on something that was was really relative. I mean, what she thought was relative, it wasn't really relative. It wasn't absolute, but um, I enjoyed the, the discount. So um, for what that was worth, even though I told her that I was 45 and not 65, she still gave me the, uh, the discount. <laughs> and rocks, our absolute ages are based on what's called uh, primarily radiometric dating. There's some other um, dating methods there. And that comes from the idea that um, radioisotopes <clears throat> change at a fairly steady pace. And so we know how long it takes uh, from one isotope to turn into the other. 
And so if we look at a rock and we find out <clears throat> its composition of, of isotopes, we can then make that clock go backwards and say, this is how old that particular rock is. And that's where we get our uh, thousands and millions of years uh, for many of the rocks. <clears throat> and we'll talk more about uh, why that is. Uh, or what are some problems with that? <clears throat> but igneous rocks are the only ones that can be dated that way. Um, and it's because that's the ones that were actually formed at a particular time and haven't changed in any way since then. So the sedimentary rock is a combination of uh, rocks that have been broken up. And, and if you were to take those pieces of, of sand or those grains, you could actually date each one of them in the same way, but they would all be, um, different and you could never really tell how old that particular sediment was. Excuse me, and the metamorphic rock has changed. <clears throat> so how are things like sedimentary rocks and fossils dated? Well, <clears throat> it's based on that idea of those, uh, of the pancakes. If you have a, um, if you're making pancakes and you know just how old those pancakes are because of, of when you put them there based on an absolute age and something else were to come in, <clears throat> let's just say um, a fly were to land on a pancake and you put the other pancake on top, you, you really weren't dating the fly. But because they were between two pancakes where you knew the age, you knew that the fly was put there sometime between those two pancakes. So, <clears throat> Um, a lot of times there's fossils that are uh, in that sedimentary layer and we can't actually date the sedimentary layer, <clears throat> but we, we can use those isometric datings or radiometric datings <clears throat> and determine how old the bottom layer was and the layer right above that. And we say then our fossils were between there. So if we have a fossil or if we have a, a date of let's say 1.7 million years here and a, a date of, of um, 1.7 three million years here, we know that that uh, where the fossil is, is it's probably going to be between those two dates. So that's the relative age. It's related to those other rocks, not dating that particular fossil <clears throat> itself. Well, sometimes we have fossils that don't have any igneous layers near there, nearby. And so because of that, they use what are called index fossils. <clears throat> and this is gonna be helpful for us when we talk about how we can interpret um, these sedimentary layers as an indication of the flood. So bear with me on these, <clears throat> on an index fossil. So um, within these fossil layers, in fact, let me just go back to this particular um, graphic right here. <clears throat> there are certain uh, types of animals that are found or plants or, or animals both in each of these layers. So if you have this layer that's kind of a, a pink salmon color, <clears throat> they, there are certain fossils in it that you would not find in this green layer several layers above, okay? So if you were to find something like this pink salmon layer or you would find some fossils here um, and you knew the age of this based on the rocks below or above it and you <clears throat> found some fossils somewhere else on the earth that look like these fossils, then you would say, well, it must be this old because it's the same fossil that we found somewhere else. And that actually could be somewhere in a different part of the world on a different continent. So we call those index fossils because we, we, we know the date of some fossils based on um, where it's located near igneous layers, <clears throat> and then we find fossils that look like them somewhere else and say, well, it must be that same time. Okay, so that's actually an indication that, that we're just using um, some pretty good guesswork on most of the dates uh, for fossils. Okay, <clears throat> well, just based on what we learned, I think you can, you can answer this next question, right? <clears throat> so what kind of rock is here? There's a fossil in there. So is it an igneous rock? Well, it can't be an igneous rock because what would have happened to um, any, any fossil or any animal that was in that igneous rock? Um, this is like lava <clears throat> or something like that. It would have been, um, as it was being laid down, it would have been completely incinerated. So there would be no fossil there. 
and they wouldn't be metamorphic rock <clears throat> because it would have changed. So this has to be uh, a fossil in sedimentary rock, rock that was laid down, um, has broken up rocks and settled down. So can we actually date this fossil? And the answer is no. We really don't know how old that fossil is, but we can give it a relative age if <clears throat> there are igneous rock below or above it. Okay, so, so that's the basic idea between how we date fossils. And there's um, a lot of speculation that goes into that because we don't actually know the date of the fossils. And <clears throat> the date of the igneous rock is based on speculation that we actually know um, how much of certain isotopes were there at the beginning and that how they change is at a steady pace, which <clears throat> that, that's not actually true. Um, those, uh, the radioisotopes change, uh, how they change from one isotope to the other actually can vary based on temperature, uh, pressure, and some other things as well. <clears throat> and just as an interjection here, and also because we are up against the clock, um, the, the way we date fossils <clears throat> is based on these methods that have some pretty serious assumptions. And uh, there's a group within uh, Young Earth Creation, some scientists there that, that did a, a project and it's called the RATE project, and that's R-A-T-E for radioisotopes in the age of the earth. And they tried to develop uh, some different models based on uh, a young earth. And they were able to um, come up with some decay rates for these isotopes that fit very well within the, the young earth model. And if you're interested in these type of things from a, a physics perspective, you can look that up, the RATE project. Again, that's radioisotopes in the age of the earth. And I think that might be helpful to you. It's well beyond um, <clears throat> what I understand because I'm a biologist and not a physicist, but the graphs on there uh, and their explanation of how they do that is very, very helpful. So again, how do we know the age of the earth and how do we, old, how do we know how old these are? It's because of the geological time scale. <clears throat> and that's a little bit about how we date things. So what about the fossil record and how they're formed? <clears throat> and I want us just to, um, there, there's an idea within um, evolution circles that the fossil record, fossil record gives us a, a clue as to how things have evolved from the first life to the diversity that we have today. But in reality, <clears throat> um, fossils are rare. So when I was a, a student at Clemson, I uh, went to a, a discussion one time by a geologist and it was for people like me, for an entomology group, and he was talking about how fossils form. And he asked us a, <clears throat> what I thought to be an interesting question. He said, really, we're asking the wrong question when we ask, how come we have so many fossils? He said, a better question is, should ask is, why do we have any fossils at all? Because the process of fossilization is really hard to come by. Um, <clears throat> the way that uh, things run today because of the fall, if something dies, there's something else that's going to eat it or get rid of it for us so that it doesn't get piled higher. Um, <clears throat> and this is a very helpful thing to us. So if something gets hit in the road by a car, it's not going to become a fossil. Right? <clears throat> if you uh, have a pet animal and you bury it and you try to go dig it up uh, two or three years later, you won't find anything left. Um, <clears throat> I use a compost pile and we've uh, put some uh, chicken parts in that compost pile. And within a week, all you can find left are the, are the feet. You know, there's nothing, no bones or anything left because things uh, decay very, very quickly. So what has to happen for a, <clears throat> a fossil to actually form? Well, you have to have uh, sediments <clears throat> that come over those fossils, you know, those sedimentary layers and under high pressure. And then also with the idea that water can, can run through those so that uh, the bones can be changed into rock through mineralization, you can actually have a fossil form, right? And, and this idea of sediments forming really fast and burying things doesn't happen very often. And when it does, it, only very few species are, are there. <laughs> so these fossil bearing sediments, they, they have to not only be solidified into that rock, 
but then they, from an evolutionary perspective, they have to last for these millions of years. Well, what do we know happens to things like this? Well, erosion takes place all over the earth. And then if you're talking on a larger, broader geological scale, we have things like subduction taking place. And this is where <clears throat> parts of the landmass is actually going back down into the magma and being uh, melted. Um, and so that happens. And then also the metamorphic rock, there's rocks that are being changed. <clears throat> so the idea that um, the question is, why do we have many fossils at all is really a good question. And I know the answer to that. And that answer is because of the flood. <laughs> and that's why we have so many fossils. And that makes a lot of sense. But from an evolutionary perspective, those who are actually think about these things, they really do end up scratching their head and asking, why do we have so many fossils? And they say things like this, we're very fortunate to have so many fossils. <laughs> so, well, what do those fossils do for us? Those uh, <clears throat> fossils supposedly give us an indication of um, how life uh, came from one common ancestor to the present. And we do have some changes that have taken place, um, or it appears like there's some changes over time from something that may be less complex to something more complex. Um, but again, that's when you come at it from a perspective of an evolutionist. When you come at it from a perspective of a, a creationist, you actually ask different questions and, and find uh, different things. And let me just give you one example. <clears throat> and that's something called the Cambrian. So, um, yeah, I will... I guess I, I won't probably get to the Cambrian layer, but there's a layer. Well, let me just pull this picture up here. Um, and in this area right down here, here's the Proteozoic. And you see this layer that says the Cambrian layer? In this layer <clears throat> right here, this is probably the beginning of the flood, by the way. This, much, much of this area is represented by the flood. Well, all the animals you can see in this picture just looks like a few trilobites. But almost every type of body plan that we see today is represented here in the Cambrian. Um, so what evolutionists have called this era is they call this the Cambrian explosion. So if you look down here in the Proteozoic, there's hardly any fossils at all. And then all of a sudden, <clears throat> within one time span, that we have almost every particular body plan. And what I mean by a body plan is like there's a, a, a mammal body plan. So if you take dogs and cats and deer, that would all represent a body plan. Or if you were to think about things like um, squid and octopuses, that would be a type of body plan. Or things like uh, insects or spiders, those would all be a body plan. And all, and all those types of body plans are represented down here in the Cambrian. But then as you go up, there's some changes that take place. In other words, they don't all look the same. They look much different as you go up. And the question is why? And the answer is, I don't know, <clears throat> but I'm going to give you a resource that might help with that, because this is one of those things where I have to scratch my head, say it doesn't make sense the way I think it should happen, um, but others have some different ideas from a creation perspective that might be helpful, okay? Well, one last thing about, um, about rocks, and then we'll move on to living things, because that's where I would much, I feel much more comfortable. I want to show you a picture of um, the Grand Canyon to help answer this question. Uh, what does the geological time scale actually indicate? Well, what we can see, I, um, the Lord provided a really neat trip for me this last summer to celebrate my 20th anniversary with my wife. We were able to go to the Grand Canyon um, there in Arizona, in the United States, and to, uh, to use that. And you see all these layers in there, and they really are there. Those layers are there, and they were laid down over time. And um, the general model is that these were <clears throat> laid down over millions and millions of years. Well, one of the interesting things is that there's no sign of much erosion between those layers. So even today, there's erosion going on within minutes, hours, days that could erode good parts of, of the the rock that's here. So that's one indication that this is um, from the flood actually sitting sedimentary layer over sedimentary layer over sedimentary layer over a 40 day period. Well, here's another interesting thing. And <clears throat> there's one layer within the Grand Canyon that's called the Tapete Sandstone. 
and it's actually represented right here. This is a Grand Canyon, and there's this layer here, which is close to the Cambrian layer that I mentioned before. And this was found here at this, this point number one. <clears throat> well, if we go over here to the, the eastern part of the United States, we actually find the same rock layer over here. And then if we were to go to Northern Africa, we were to find the same rock layer. Then if we go over here to, towards the Middle East, we find that same rock layer. As a matter of fact, we find that same rock layer almost throughout the entire world. And many of these other layers, they can be found in other places around the world too. So what does that indicate about this layer that was found in the Grand Canyon? Was that just in that Arizona area? No, that layer, that whole layer really covered the vast majority of, of the landmass that we have today. That's pretty incredible. <clears throat> well, how did that happen? It's sediment, right? Those sediments have to be, have to actually come up and cover the area and then be settled down. <clears throat> well, this is a pretty good indication that this was a global flood when we see layers that are exactly the same in multiple parts of the earth. Well, how do we know that it's the same layer? <clears throat> well, that it's that the same basic idea. We, there's this Tapete sandstone all throughout the earth. There's the same chemicals. There's the same fossils. The actual grain sizes are the same. And then uh, there's other features that geologists use. And, and to me, this is amazing. And I don't, I, maybe I only know of this because I just read the creation literature, but um, that this is um, things that, that other geologists point out too. They know that this happens across the world. So how did it get that way? Well, the, the explanation from the Bible is through the flood, and not just a local flood, like old earth creationists would have to hold to, but a global flood, one that covered the entire earth. And that makes um, better sense from a creation perspective. Okay, well, <clears throat> that's what I'm, I think that that's gonna be helpful to you. <clears throat> because really, ultimately, the geological time frame is a friend to recent creationists, to younger creationists. <clears throat> when you interpret that through um, what the Bible tells us about not only creation, but about the flood, it, it really is our friend. It's not something that we need to be um, afraid of. We just have to interpret it differently because we have different assumptions. Well, Joel, any questions come up about that? Uh, no, I mean, just some uh, discussions here. Um, very fascinating to see the big picture of the earth layer. A comment here as far as the Tapete's uh, layer. It could also be first day creation sediment or pre-dry land. Um, but I guess maybe because it would be just under Cambrian, we would be more inclined to think flood connected. Is that? That's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the, where, there, where there are no fossils at all, that's what we consider from a creation perspective to be the creation rocks. Okay, and again, I'm going to point, point us to a resource that where you have some geologists talking to you about these things. <laughs> I think that'll be helpful. Okay, well, I'm going to uh, move on. We have about, according to my watch, about 35 minutes, <clears throat> and that should give us enough time to cover the last two ideas. The one is really what one of my favorite and one that I feel, uh, of everything that we've talked about today, I, I feel most comfortable talking about evolution, uh, biological evolution, um, especially as it appeals or occurs, or how, how creationists have to deal with this. Um, I teach a class on evolution, and I mentioned that to you at the beginning of the session. Um, and when my students come in, I get uh, freshmen, and then I teach a class on the junior and senior level. And um, the ideas that people come with, especially those that were raised in a, a Christian home, <clears throat> a fundamentalist Christian home, is the idea that anything that has to do with evolution is, um, uh, is bad. Um, scientists that believe in evolution are stupid, and, and it just goes downhill from there. So on the, um, on the front of things here, just want to indicate that um, the scientists that hold evolution are actually very smart. They're very wise, and, um, and there's very few of them that are Christians. So that's what the scripture tells us that we should expect, that there's not very many wise 
uh, that really are believers, but these are not dumb people. Um, they use their senses well, and the theories that they come up with are based on uh, evidence that they're looking for because of questions that they're asking, and it's uh, filtered through their own worldview that there is no God, <clears throat> or if there is a God, he used evolutionary processes to get where we are today. Um, but remember that all people are made in God's image, and these people um, can be used to actually give us very helpful information. And so what I hope to explain to you next is that, again, we just like the geological time scale, that is really our friend from a biblical perspective. Some of the ideas that <clears throat> we can learn or glean from an evolutionist can be our friend and help us explain the diversity of life that we have uh, from the flood to the present, just a few thousand years ago. And I hope that what we discuss over the next few minutes might be a help to you, um, especially as you have uh, conversations with people who hold to an evolutionary worldview. Okay. <clears throat> so the first question that we want to ask today is, well, what is evolution? And again, when I use that term, I'm talking about biological evolution. What is evolution? Well, this is the, um, <clears throat> uh, the center of a uh, piece in the um, University of Notre Dame up in, um, in Indiana. And it states right there in the middle of their science building, <clears throat> this is the Jordan Hall of Science, it says nothing in biology makes sense except in light of evolution. And this is a, a famous statement by a geneticist named Theodosius Dobzhansky. And here's his picture. He was in the uh, Russian Orthodox Church. So a lot of people make a big deal about that because they said, well, look, here's a Christian who um, believes in evolution. So we should believe in evolution too. But really, what's, what's at the heart of what he's saying? He's saying that if you're a biologist, you really can't understand anything <clears throat> unless you look at it through the lens He's using the idea of a light, something that's illuminating on what we're studying through the light or the illumination of evolution. And so when evolutionists talk about evolution, that really is what they believe, that, there's, that this is the only game in town. This is the only explanation for biology is this process of evolution. So what is evolution, right? That's our question. <clears throat> well, one of us, Dobzhansky's uh, friend and um, contemporary, Ernst Mayer, he, he said this, and I'm going to read this and emphasize it in a certain way. He says, the theory of evolution is quite rightly called the greatest unifying theory in biology. Now, that's really saying the same thing that Dobzhansky said. Nothing in evolution makes sense except in the light of evolution. And he's saying it on the positive side. This is the greatest unifying theory for biology is evolution. So, so what? The diversity of organisms, what they look like, their similarities and their differences, how they're distributed on the earth, the, the behavior that they have, how they interact with one another. All of this was merely just a bewildering chaos of facts until given meaning by the evolutionary theory. So through both of these, you can see that what they're talking about is a particular light or a perspective particular way of thinking to help make sense of the world around us. So when they say evolution, they're talking about a grand overarching theory. Okay, so that's where we're heading. But now when you want to really find out what evolution is, we want to, it, it would be helpful to, to go to the dictionary, right? Or at least go to some, some books. So what I, what I did is I compiled some definitions out of um, textbooks. And these are textbooks that are used in, um, at, at least in American universities, and I think in universities in Europe as well, um, both on the undergraduate and the graduate school level. This first textbook um, is a graduate level uh, textbook. <clears throat> and right out of the glossary, when you look up what evolution is, it says originally defined as descent with modification. And that's the idea that Darwin came up with. He proposed two different ideas. One was descent with modification, um, or he says, or change in the characteristics of populations over time. 
currently it defines as changes in allele frequencies over time. Now, when you hear the word changes in allele frequencies over time, unless you've studied biology any time recently, that probably doesn't make any sense to you. <clears throat> but if we say this, which would be a little bit different, but mean the same thing, change in gene frequencies over time, that might make better sense to you because you've probably heard of genes. Um, that's part of your uh, the molecule of DNA that codes for proteins or maybe regulatory in which proteins are are sequenced or not. So this definition just says that there's a change and that change takes place on the genetic level. <clears throat> okay, that's evolution. Well, can these changes in allele frequency help us explain everything in biology? And the answer is no. So we must be talking about two different things. So here's another definition from, um, this is biological evolution, or that's the definition from this particular textbook. This would be an undergraduate level textbook, which says any change in the inherited traits of a population, again, those are the, the gene frequencies, those inherited traits, any change in the inherited traits of a population that occurs from generation to the next. Okay, so again, talking about from a genetic perspective, all biological evolution is, is change in um, the frequency of certain genes that organisms in a population have. Does that help us explain everything in evolution or in biology? Excuse me. The answer is no. So again, must be two definitions going on. <clears throat> this is a, um, an upper level or graduate school textbook. And it says that evolution are heritable changes in genes, features, organisms, populations, and species through time. Let me, let me shorten this definition for you. Just take out the, uh, uh, pair, uh, the prepositional phrase that starts with N and just change it to heritable changes through time. And that's what they mean. It's just change over time. Change over what? Change in what? Well, anything in biology. It's just change. That's all evolution is. Well, it's not until we get to this particular textbook, which again is another um, uh, upper level or graduate school level. It actually kind of puts, all, puts these two together uh, as one. It says broadly defined as instances and in change over time. And that's really what we've been seeing in all those other textbooks. But then he says more specifically in a biological context, it's the process of descent with modification that is responsible for the origin, maintenance, and diversity of life. So he's actually bringing back in that worldview that says it's a, it's a process that's actually caused all the change that we see, okay? Well, this is helpful for us in two ways because I want us to introduce, to, I want to introduce you to, well, hopefully I'm not introducing it to you, something that you know, it's a logical fallacy and it's called the logical fallacy of equivocation. So what I just gave you are some textbook definitions of evolution <clears throat> and then also one particular textbook that, that fleshes it out to mean that it's, it's broader than just change over time. So whenever you have a, uh, something like equivocation, you're using a term in one instance in, um, in a context, and then you're changing the meaning of it within that same context, okay? So let me give you an example of that. So um, with Joel, you, you know, he, he introduced me as Dr. Boyd, right? So I'm Dr. Boyd. So what do you think about this? How many definitions of doctor are being used here? Right. I'm, I cannot help you with an ear infection, <clears throat> right? But you can go to a doctor and get some help with an ear infection, right? So this is an example of equivocation. I, I was going to, usually in my classes, I would ask for other <clears throat> versions of that, but, um, and a lot of people can come up with, with lots of different ways where you can shift meaning. <clears throat> um, I want to give you a, um, a picture. This actually is making fun of um, Young Earth Creationist, this cartoon, but it's in my the evolution textbook that I use for my evolution class. And see if you can pick out the equivocation here. Um, I, the print may be small, so I, I may have to read it to you up here. But here's a, a fellow in the doctor's office, and he says, TB, that's tuberculosis. Are you sure? And then he says, um, well, I can't read it either. Apparently, uh, but we caught it early. 
And then the man says, so my friend, is, is my prognosis good? And then he asks this question, it depends. Are you a creationist? And he says, why? Why, yes, yes, I am. Why do you ask? Because I need to know if you want me to treat um, this bug before. Uh, in other words, the idea that it's antibiotic resistance. You want me to treat it before it became antibiotic resistance or not? Or as the multiple, mul multiple drug resistant strain that it's evolved into. And then he asks, evolved? And he says, your choice. If you go with the Noah's art version, I'll give you streptomycin. Then he says, uh, what are the other drugs like? Then he says, they're intelligently designed. So he's, this is a, a classic example of equivocation because he's equating the change in uh, tuberculosis bacterium as um, something that has evolved. But that's actually not, those, he's using two different things. Are you a creationist? Why, yes. Well, why does that matter? Do creationists believe that uh, TB can develop antibiotic resistance? Well, absolutely. But do they have to believe in evolution to do that? No way. <clears throat> not at all. And that gets us to the, the terms that I started this section with, <clears throat> and that is evolution and adaptation. Okay. Most of the definitions that um, we saw, those that are change in allele frequencies over time or change in gene frequencies over time or just change over time are nothing more than organisms, populations of organisms that are able to adapt um, to changing environments. And that in the process, that the term for that process of change over time is um, natural selection. I want to just pause for a second because, again, I get this from a lot of my um, students that grew up in fundamentalist homes. Whenever you use the term natural selection, <clears throat> again, the idea there is that this is something that, that we can't agree with because evolutionists um, use it. But if we, actually, if we have a better understanding of what natural selection um, as a process can help us with, then I don't think it's really a, um, that much of a problem. Let me give you an example. Of, um, of what natural selection is. And we'll, what we'll do is we'll actually ask this question, is natural se selection evolution? Right. Based on those definitions that we saw before that just change over time, the answer would be yes. But is that what evolutionists mean when they say, are you a creationist or an evolutionist? No, what they mean is, do you believe that all life that we have today came from one common ancestor through the process of descent with modification? So they're not the same thing. Okay, <clears throat> let me give you um, an example of what natural selection looks like in the real world. In this particular example, <clears throat> we have a bunch of snails <clears throat> and snails uh, produce lots and lots of snails. And within a snail population, the way the way that all organisms have been designed, and I would argue designed by God, is that there's inherent variation within that population. And you don't have to look far to, to see that variation. If you have more than one child, you know that from the, the two of you, you and your wife, can come in an enormous amount of variation. I have five children and none of them look alike. Even if you're an identical twin, you may not look exactly like your twin, um, but other twins that are not identical, they usually don't look anything alike. <clears throat> and then if you um, breed animals like dogs or, or cats or anything like that, you know that there's a huge amount of variation uh, within a particular population. Well, depending on the environment, some of those organisms that have one particular trait versus another can actually produce more offspring. And so over time, you end up with um, a limitation in that variation so that some organisms have uh, certain traits that look different than others as depicted here. And this is something that we see, um, we really see all the time in a, uh, in a natural setting, whether you're looking at plants or animals or bacteria, this is a process <clears throat> that's taking place. Now, one thing I want to point out to you is this variation. This has to do with the amount of genetic material that's there from an evolutionary perspective through evolutionary time, 
um, you actually increase the amount of variation or increase the amount of genetics that are there. But through the process of natural selection in the sifting method, you really lose variation. And that's a key idea that I try to emphasize with my students because uh, for evolution to occur, you have to gain information. But really everything that we see, whether it's natural selection or other processes, over time we lose information. So that the further we go out from the starting point, the variation drops and drops and drops. And <laughs> it, it's, it really gives, it makes one like me scratch his head sometime to even see why people think something like natural selection can be a proof that we all came from a common ancestor because <clears throat> it, it, it actually reveals the exact opposite. And that's why it's our friend, not our foe. As long as we understand what it is, I, it can be very helpful to us. Well, if you've been around uh, very long and have been in these type of arguments or discussions, you've probably all heard of Darwin's finches from the Galapagos Island. And I wanted to just run through um, a series of a multi-year experiment to demonstrate what natural selection can do for these birds. One of the things that you can notice is that the bill on this particular one is um, smaller than the bill over here. Okay, same species, different size bill, and this bill here can eat certain types, that this bird can eat certain side types of seeds that this one can't, and vice versa. So depending on the environment, whether it's a drought season or a rainy season, depends on the type of seeds that are available. And so the variation for these then changes from time to time. Okay, are you with me on that? All right, so here's just a picture of, um, this is back in the 1970s, and this red line indicates the medium, the median beak or the average uh, for the beak death. And you see that there's a, a broad spectrum, there's a large variation. These are the number of individuals, number of finches that have this particular size beak. So it goes from large to small. And just follow that red line. This is one year. Um, year two, 1977, <clears throat> there was a drought. Um, there were fewer and harder seeds, and only those with the large beaks could break open the seeds. Okay, so what do you think is going to happen to those finches with small beaks? Well, they're not going to produce as many offspring. And that, but the, even the next year, there were very few, if any, finches that hatched. Well, what happened the next year? See this red line? It's actually shifted. Now we actually have larger uh, beaks on these finches. And let me just show you these two graphs together. And you notice the red line, it's actually shifted over. Okay, so, so what do we have here? We have a change over time in what? In the size of the beaks, right? Is that evolution? Does that prove that all life came from one common ancestor? Absolutely not. It just proves that there's variation within the finches and that when a drought occurs, some finches are still gonna be able to survive and have offspring. Right? And I would go back and say, just like the Lord intended, he's given us the ability to, to, to vary so that when changes happen, we can actually do well and survive. So I gave you a three years data, three years worth of data. What about 30 years? This graph actually depicts, here's the two years that I was showing you. Right, and you see the large difference in the beak sizes. But what happened over time? Did, did it actually anything change? No, it's just the, the variation in the beak sizes changed over time. That's all that happens. And we had, this is all the way to uh, 2007, I believe. The folks that do this, um, this study are still working today. And they, so we have data that goes out uh, to the current year. And almost any of these traits, when something's being, being observed year after year after year, we see that that change fluctuates with the environment. And that's the beauty of what natural selection does for us. Okay. So again, just follow through with this. I'm, I'm going to jump ahead to um, some resources here in just a little bit once I get to the end of this, um, this idea. So um, <clears throat> what I've just to explain to you is that within um, a population of organisms, they have um, a lot of variation in that population. Some of that variation is inherited more than others, depending on the environment. 
And so if those traits are genetic or heritable, then that's what's going to be found in the next generation. And in essence, all that is, that's, that's all that natural selection is. And if we were to go back to uh, that cartoon that I showed you, that TB resistant bacteria, that's all that is. That has nothing to do with evolution or creation. <laughs> it has everything to do with uh, TB's ability to adapt to new situations. So does natural selection provide evidence for evolution? Not, not evolution. What does it do? Right, well, well, am I right? Have you guys heard of Darwin's finches before? It's evidence for evolution. And almost everyone in the world probably has, but that's not evolution. It's just adaptation because natural selection doesn't equal evolution. It equals adaptation. Okay, so let me just show you a, a graphic of what evolution actually is. This is a time scale in millions of years. And this is the one common ancestor that gave rise to everything, all the diversity of life that we have today. So can something like the beaks of finches help explain what's going on in this graphic? And the answer is absolutely not. Well, what about the snails that I showed you? No way. Because in essence, all that's going on is we're losing information, not uh, gaining information. And this is just a complete uh, an increase of information that's not just improbable, it is impossible. You cannot do that. This is today, and all this is is just one major tree that branches out. And it's, this is everything from bacteria all the way to humans. And if we were to blow this up, one of the fascinating things to me is that you would think that, of course, humans are the pinnacle and you would have humans at the bottom, but they don't. They have something else down there. <laughs> so, um, so let me talk to you just for a second about the terms microevolution and macroevolution, because some people would use the, what I just described from the, the beaks of the finches as microevolution. And what you see here on this picture is macroevolution. But anytime you want to use the term evolution, you want to keep in mind that new information is being produced. That's at the heart of any, any type of evolution. New information, and that would be genetic information. But adaptation is really a better term than microevolution because that organisms really are adapting to the environment based on information that they already have. Not that they're getting new information, even, and if there's a mutation, you'll actually hear of mutations. What mutations do for us is that it, that's a loss of information. That's not an addition of information. When you, when you take a word and you mutate it by changing one of the letters in it, have you given any new information? Well, not really. You probably made a misspelled word. Or if you spelled a different word, it's not that you have any different information. You had information and now it's just a different piece of information, not new information. So I don't like the terms microevolution and macroevolution, even though they're used broadly today, because it, it leads to a misconception there. This isn't a, um, an argument between those two. It really is, it is adaptation, the idea that organisms can adapt to their environment over time, not, not the organism itself, but the populations of organisms adapt over time. Is that proof that all life came from a common ancestor? And the answer is no. But does it help us explain the diversity of life that we have today from the flood to the present? We may have to answer that on a different day. Because <laughs> I would argue um, that, that yes, it does. And um, one of the, the article that I wrote for Answers in Genesis tries to help explain that a little bit uh, through a process of how do we get different species from one species. Does that one species actually get new information to become new species? And the answer is generally no or, or no at all. But that over time, it, it loses information that it no longer needs and those populations split up. So now you have two populations that have a change in their information and they, they can't actually come back together and breed anymore. They've actually become two different species, not because they've gained information, because those populations have lost information over time. And I think um, if we take the same process that goes on today, and I have some examples of, um, of this actually happening relatively quickly, and we move this back just a few thousand years ago, 
where things like uh, adaptation have taken place so that organisms uh, can adapt to new situations. That, like after the flood, if we were to think about what the environment would look like after the flood, it would be completely different. And then as the waters receded and as plants started growing, the ability for organisms, because they were got, they have God-given variation, they can adapt in those new situations very rapidly and refill the earth and uh, end up with the diversity that we have today, I think is, um, is arguable. Here's just a couple of examples of, of adaptation that takes place. These are in Britain, these birds. And uh, as uh, many people in, in Britain like to put out bird feeders, the ones in Britain are actually a little bit different than other places in Europe. And these birds have to have a little bit longer beaks to get to the seed. And so if you look at the same species of bird in other places in Europe, they have smaller beaks than the ones in Europe. And that only took place after a couple of decades um, where these birds now all have longer beaks so that they can get to, uh, to seed and bird feeders. And then these, um, these mice up here, this particular, the darker mouse is found primarily on lava flows. And this particular mouse is found on the sandy areas next to lava flows. But they're actually the same species. And this is one example that evolutionists give to prove evolution, but in actuality, uh, those organisms that are darker survive better on lava flows, cooled down lava flows, because they're black. And then these lighter colored ones um, favor much better on sandy areas because of uh, uh, predation. Okay. So let me ask you what our Christian response would be to things like this. Because again, I get a lot of people that get kind of upset with me and say, what, we can use natural selection to our favor? We should stay away from that. Well, the idea of natural selection, it, it really is a, a process that we see happening in many, many different ways. <clears throat> and I really think that we can take to heart Psalm 111. I wanna show you parts of Psalm 111 here. And uh, because of time, I'm going to emphasize the underlying words. <clears throat> and I'm going to emphasize that what we, what we see in action today is one of the works of the Lord. Those are great. And there's people like me, as a biologist, that really take great pleasure and delight in studying and looking after them. And really becoming amazed at how God has created the world and made them so, I'm going to use a good word for you, have made these animals so adaptable. It's incredible at what organisms can adapt to because of how God has made them. Well, this is one of the things that the conclusion of Psalm 111 really hits us. It's the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And when you start with that, when you see things like what I just demonstrated to you, that you have the fear of the Lord, that's not going to shake your faith when you see some animals that can adapt. Even if other people use them, those same pieces of evidence to try to demonstrate that all life came from a common ancestor. We don't have to go there. We can actually fear God and keep his commandments. So I take pleasure in these things. And part of my pleasure, it comes from the fact that I fear the Lord. I really want to desire to, to love him with all my heart. And so I'm, I'm not scared of these things. I can use them um, for my, for my own benefit. Okay, so let me end this idea. Natural selection um, just provides one part of a model to help explain the diversity of life that we see today and how it got here since the flood. And again, that, um, that paper that, that I sent to Joel helps explain that somewhat, but it's not, uh, not through evolution, through adaptation. Okay, so how are we doing, Joel? Great, very helpful. I remember the first time encountering, um, it, this was in my biology class there at BJU, but encountering the idea that speciation, like new species could continue to develop all the way into the present. And that, that initially kind of threw me until, oh. help me on this, um, understanding that the, the level that we're talking about, let's say a biblical kind or on the ark, somewhere okay. around the genus or family level, somewhere in there, is that right? Am I getting that right? Yeah, that's correct. Primarily on the family level is where most of us would put that. Okay. Yeah. Um, I mean, so getting some of this helps helps the apologetic conversation go a lot better, I think, because we want to be as accurate with our information as we possibly can be. And right. 
get allergic to anything, um, what, anything that sounds connected remotely to an idea we disagree with, let's actually explore and find out what is true, what's actually happening in the real world, and not be afraid of the information. That's right. We, it's true. It's very helpful. Thank you. Good. Well, I'm going to have to take a quick break. I have one more thing, but I really need to run to the restroom. So give me five minutes, no, two minutes, and I'll be right back, okay? Very good. Thank you. Um, while he's stepping away, any questions that you want to have or any discussion? Um, what, that's just the concept we just discussed there. Any feedback, something you want to drop into the chat, um, happy to interact about that for a second if you've got questions there. And I should also say he's mentioned several times here the resources that he'll share. Um, I'll put that up on the Moodle. So that'll be just give me 10 minutes after the class is done and you can pull that information in there. Um, any interaction that you want to have as far as this idea, the idea, idea of adaptation, uh, what he was explaining for us, something like drug uh, resistance developing over time. This is, this is not proving evolution. This is an idea that we're completely comfortable with. And so this kind of adaptation and then the selection for these traits, this exists. There is a natural selection. Uh, the, the antibiotic kills off the the, the um, kills off any bacteria that aren't able to sustain and those that are able to sustain go on. Okay, well that's natural selection. Any, any questions or discussion there? Comment here, I think it's great to identify that adaptation occurs on the population level, not the individual animals level. It's good, um, helpful thought there. And uh, anything else, you can feel free to drop that in. We'll do, we can do more discussion here. I'm looking forward to him giving us resources and so we'll come back to that a little later on. And that gives us a, a way to keep on researching and learning. And then remember also on the Moodle page, I also have the forum there. And so if you want to ask a question at our final lecture, I work to try to answer any questions that you've left up for me. Okay, so feel free to drop those questions in there and then we'll do some research and I'll get back to you with that. Okay, Dr. Boyd. Yeah, thank you. Sorry about that. <clears throat> um, so it, I, I think um, eventually there's ways for me to actually see any comments that you guys have made, and I'll try to work through those. I'm going to try to give you um, some resources uh, now, but I also want to let you know that um, you're you're welcome to email me at any time. Um, I think Joel can can give you that. But my name is David Boyd, and so if you just remember, the first letter is D, as in David. D boy D B O Y D at B J U dot E D U. And I'll be happy to try to, to get back to you. Okay. Um, the first resource that I want to tell you about is actually a movie. It's a documentary that was recently uh, came out and I've been thoroughly impressed with this. Um, it's asked the question is Genesis history and it was released here in the United States. And then it's been produced on a DVD or or Blu-ray or something like that. And um, I'm gonna, again, I'm gonna try to take you to um, the website. I think I now know how to do that and, and show you um, how to get this. This comes from a recent creation perspective. And um, it's, it's helpful in that it, it goes and it talks to, um, let's see here, there we go. Is that, is things moving around there? We got it. Very okay. Um, it's a really great website, but he, um, the person that does this, um, that did this particular movie, went and interviewed um, young earth creationists or recent creationists based on their expertise. And then he produced a movie about that, our documentary. And I, and if this is something that's of interest to you, I, I think it would be well worth your time to do that. And then if you were to, to go down, um, there's something like the trailer, but if you were to go down and you had more, questions about it. You see here it says after seeing the film actually has some more information um, in some of these um, videos that are that are just here online that, that go back and and talk to some of these same scientists and ask specific questions. Now, <clears throat> um, so even like if I were to kind of click, no that's that. All right, let me well, I'm not seeing what I'm looking for. Um, yeah, here's the idea where you can watch videos. If you click on this, um, 
this goes, you can see from this particular picture, this is going to be something based on geology. Um, and this is a, another Dr. Boyd right here, by the way. He's a Hebrew scholar. And he talks about things dealing with um, Genesis and uh, um, interpretation of that. And then you can see here, here's another um, person that's going to talk to you about what natural selection is and give some different examples than what I gave you. Um, and, and, and just keep going down and there's just more and more and more, <laughs> more research. I, like I said, I've just been thoroughly impressed with, with this group. I don't know a whole lot about um, Dell Tackett, who's the one who, who uh, did this. This would be this um, particular fellow here. Um, but the people that he, inter that he interviews, I'm familiar with and have great respect for, um, for the work that they do. So I think that really would be a great resource for you over time to just be able to um, go back and look. Um, if you have uh, the resources to purchase the, the DVD or the video, um, I would encourage you to do that. Um, I've watched it. Um, I'm looking forward to the time when I can uh, show it to my kids. Um, I think it's gonna be, a, my children rather, it's gonna be a real help to them as well. Joel, have you seen this one? I've not, I'm excited about checking it out. Yeah, I think it would be helpful to you. Excellent, thank you, very good. Okay. Um, <clears throat> the other thing is, is actually answers in Genesis. Um, I, I mentioned to you that I, um, I have uh, some articles that I've written there. There are two primarily ones that you can look up there. Um, if you go to their website, which, um, which is here and, it, and I, because of the time, I don't think I'll go to it. Um, but they, um, it, it's a well-known uh, group of young earth creationists and just about any question that you might have, um, they can answer that on just about any level, whether it be a technical level or something that's more of a general, um, general, um, general basis. I think that is helpful, could be helpful to you. So on there, it says even has some okay authors that's a link to the articles that I wrote. So and they're, and they're okay. There's a lot better articles on there. Um, I mentioned the search engine is not helpful to me. Um, sometimes I'm looking for something very specific. And so let's just say I may be looking for something about natural selection. And so if I just type in the terms natural selection, it's going to probably give me two to 300 different articles. And uh, the one that I want may be, you know, number 75. <laughs> so I, I need to learn to be a little bit more specific, but it, um, some of those might, might be helpful to you. Okay, so that's just one group in the United States. There's several. Another one is um, the Institute for Creation Research. Um, they produce a, a, <clears throat> a magazine that comes out on a regular basis, and you can get it for free, and it's called Acts and Facts, and it's something that um, I get on a regular basis, and I read it, um, usually cover to cover, and I find it to be um, very helpful, gives um, uh, things that are currently happening within uh, creation research world or maybe happening within the apologetics world and come at it from a young earth perspective. Now, um, one thing that from an apologetics perspective, you guys um, may be aware of, and I'm going to see if I can say this right, uh, there's a difference in how Answers in Genesis and Institute for Creation Research um, approach uh, the whole topics. One of these is from an evidential perspective, and that would be the Institute for Creation Research. And um, Answers in Genesis comes at it um, more along the lines of, of what I do when you're, you're bringing assumptions to the table already, and it's okay, as long as you know what your assumptions are. You look at the evidence uh, through uh, your assumptions. Um, these in Institute for Creation Research tends to be evidentialist, and so they're actually looking for evidence um, to prove what, what they say they believe. So you can keep that in mind. And then a one that you may not be familiar with is Creation Ministries International. <clears throat> I'm going to uh, go to their website, or at least try to here. Um, there we go. Um, <clears throat> this is another uh, recent creation or young earth creation uh, group, and they produce a really good magazine as well, um, just called Creation. 
and um, you can see that uh, that's here and it's going to provide some very helpful um, resources for you through through their work and then also through their website um, one of the negative things about and it's really not negative about this group but it's negative about people in general is that even though we may uh, have the same belief system we're still um, uh, fallen creatures and so creation.com and answers in genesis are actually a split from um, from long ago and there's still some some issues related to that so as an example there's uh, two of the top young earth creationists who are geneticists in the world are good friends and one works at answers in genesis and the other works here at creation ministries international and um, their organizations won't let them publish anything together so <laughs> it's a uh, that's that really is um, it's an indication that we still live in a fallen world and um, you know, unity is one thing that we all still need to work on. But regardless of that, these are both great resources um, for you and, and they should be accessible uh, to the layman and um, provide some helpful stuff there. Okay. Um, let me just give you a um, one particular book that has been very helpful to me with this whole um, issue, and this is um, an edited version, uh, Coming to Grips with Genesis. And I have my copy in front of me. It's called Biblical Authority in the Age of the Earth. And um, from a young earth or recent creation perspective, uh, the authors in this book really do a good job of answering a lot of the questions that um, that I presented to you today, plus a whole lot more. Um, and it's uh, both theologically sound and uh, from a young earth creation perspective or a recent creation perspective, the science in it is really, really good. And um, it really has helped me quite a bit. And then a couple other books that have been helpful as far as the debate goes. Um, sometimes you wanna know what other people believe about this. And so there's a, a book called Reading Genesis 1 to 2, An Evangelical Conversation. It's based on a, um, a symposium that was put together by Bryan College several years ago, and really uh, was thankful to the Lord that I was able to attend that. Um, and they produced a book from that, so they have people from, from most of what I mentioned to you before, there's a young earth creationist or a recent creationist, old earth creation, um, a couple of stripes of those, and then somebody who aligns themselves with BioLogos that gives their perspectives. And in this book, they give their perspective, and then all the other authors um, provide a discussion about how they may differ from that person. And then that particular author then goes back and discusses, um, once again, or, or re refutes or rebuts what they said. And, and it's very helpful to actually get a better perspective of what people believe about Genesis 1 and 2 and how we should read it and then the implications of that today. And then the last book that I want to mention to you is one that I use in my class um, in Evolution and Origins. My students have to write a paper on the historical atom because theologically this really gets down to this gets to be the crux of the issue. Um, and so in this particular view, there's several different views of historical Adam, the, the literal Adam, um, and different views of the non-literal Adam, and uh, whether or not <clears throat> um, he was the first human, or just one human that God chose out of all the humans, or if the historical Adam was just a, a population of, of humans at one point in time. And it's similar to the previous book where the authors give their view and then the other authors um, provide a, a rebuttal on that. And um, the, the one negative thing about it, the guy who um, comes from a, a young earth creation perspective, uh, William Barrick, he's from Masters, I believe. Um, his, his attitude in here is a little too harsh for me at times, but his content is really good. So just keep that in mind. Um, but the other guys um, are really easy to read and have a good, um, good sense of uh, love for one another. And so it can be helpful uh, on that. So those are some resources and um, I'm 10 minutes over what I'm supposed to be and I'm sorry. 
<laughs> no worries at all. This is excellent. Um, very good. Thank you so much for your time. Very much appreciate your investing, investing this in us. Thank you. Yeah, well, I had no clue that I would get through it everything that I intended to. <laughs> so that's a, a grace of the Lord and probably also because there weren't too many comments to ask questions. That's usually where I get bogged down because I like to go off on tangents when people want to. I'm, I'm very glad you're able to get through all the topics because each one of these was critically helpful. And uh, the last there just gives us a lot to work through if we have further questions that, you know, really, if, if we're going to go into further questions or more specifics, that's something we can do on our own time and follow through with these that's resources. Right. Given us a You've given us a hand up so that we can continue on to do work with this. Thank you. Uh, comment here You're in welcome. the chat. Nobody here will ever complain about being over time. So that's, uh, that's our appreciation <laughs> for your time. Thank you. Um, okay. Dr. Boyd, uh, thank you again. And uh, to everyone else, we'll look forward to seeing you back again next week on Monday. We're going to be hearing about Buddhism and how to engage. Make sure you've got an assignment there that's a writing assignment. And so make sure you take the time to take a look at that and work through that so you're prepared for Monday. And then um, as we, as you have questions, drop that in the forum. We'll work to get answers for that uh, and, and just follow up with you there. Again, thank you, Dr. Boyd. I uh, appreciate all of your time and we'll look forward to maintaining contact with you as we keep on learning and growing. Okay, and I just finally did find the chat box, so I, I put a link to my email address on there, and I'll go back and read through some of these comments, too. Thank you very much. Okay, to all, uh, a good night. Dr. Boyd, have a great day. Thank you. Okay, bye-bye. Bye-bye.